Lord Jesus, we thank you for the day, for your salvation, for your spirit in our lives and our hearts, for the opportunity to gather with our brothers and sisters here today. Bless our meditation on your word. Strengthen us, Lord, to live, to follow you, to take up our cross. In Jesus' name we pray. My brothers, my sisters, it is the most offensive word in the English language. It riles us up from a very young age, and it is an affront to our very existence. We hate it. The word no. It's an awful word, right? I remember one of my children when they were very small, two years old, maybe even younger. I remember telling them they kept wanting to stick things in. Not everyone knows what this is anymore. Stick things in the VCR, right? I said, no. She looked at me, and she went to put it right back in again. I said, no. She went to put it back. No, and she just got mad because I said that awful, nasty word. No. When we grow up, we get used to the word and we love the word, right? No. No. <laughs> you see a sign that says, you keep off the grass. And immediately you're like, why? <laughs> I think I want to go on the grass. Don't tell me I can't go on the grass. Why can't I go on the grass? What's wrong with me going on the grass? Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me that I can't do something because I'm going to what? Prove to you that I can, right? Parents know you can manipulate your children that way, right? I don't think you can eat all of that. I don't think you're big enough to eat all of that. And what do the children immediately want to do? You just told me no. I'm going to prove you wrong. We hate the word no. Really what it is, and we're laughing about it, it really is our sinful nature that does not like to be told what to do. Do not tell me what I can or can't do. Do not tell me who I am or who I'm not. I get to decide who I am. I get to decide what is right. I get to determine my own future. Really what you're saying is I am my own what? God. The minute anyone tells us anything, and if anyone tells us no, we hate it. It's not only true from the outside when someone tells us no, it's true on the inside. When we try and tell our sinful nature, no, I'm not going to do that, what does the sinful nature do? It says, yes, I am. Yes, you are. I'm going to make sure that you do. And here's 15 reasons why you should do what I'm telling you to do. And it's hard to tell your sinful nature no, because there's this internal battle that's taking place. You've seen it, right? You've felt it. Even the old cartoons, I don't know if they do this anymore, but the cartoons that I watched when I was a child, on one shoulder sat an angel, and on the other shoulder sat the devil. And that's the battle that takes place in us every day, where one is whispering in your ear, just take the cookie, your mom will never know. And the angel is saying, no, don't do it. It's a battle, though, between our sinful nature and our Christian selves. Today we're going to talk about telling our sinful nature, our human flesh, no, getting that under control <coughs> as best as we can. Now, just an explanation. Um, we're not talking about salvation. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Our salvation is set and secure by the cross of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My salvation is not determined by how well I control my sinful nature, how good my, my spiritual habits are, not controlled by how, how much progress I make in my Christian life. I am saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done. But... My sinful nature wants to do everything it can to destroy my faith in Jesus Christ. You understand? It will do everything it can to try and undermine it, destroy it, 
lead me away from Jesus and from the assurance of my salvation in him. And so what we're talking about here is becoming secure and solid in our salvation and in our relationship with Jesus. Does that make sense? Are you with me? I don't think I'm talking about salvation. I'm talking about our response to God's gift of salvation. How do I make sure that I don't lose the gift that God gave to me in Jesus Christ? The gift of forgiveness, the gift of hope, the gift of life, the gift of heaven. How do I make sure that I don't lose that, that my sinful nature doesn't destroy that within me? Amen? Okay, so now we can move on. So Paul here, in our text, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about a very uh, aggressive, a very stubborn, a very determined no to our sinful nature. All right? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, this is what is written. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? That's not true of us, but he's making a point. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. <coughs> They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. All right? I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the crown. This is the word of the Lord. Sporting illustrations, two of them. One is running, right? You want to run, you want to win the race, what do you have to do? Strict training, practice, pushing yourself, running hard, right? <laughs> so that when the race comes, what? You're not just running aimlessly. Ah, I'll run for a little while. Let me run over there, and I'll run slow over here, and I'll jog over here. And over there. You might not know it because, um, because of this right here. <laughs> But I used to be quite the runner. I did. I, I went to state many times in high school, several times in high school, right? But I hated practice. I hated it. I couldn't, I, oh, I just could not stand running around and around and around. But I knew that if I wanted to win the race at the track meet, what did I have to do? Discipline myself. Practice, right? push myself, right? Beyond just what was comfortable, but to the point of being uncomfortable. That's what he's talking about here. Not just running around. There's a strict discipline that he's talking about. He talks about being a boxer then, a fighter. He's not just someone who's sitting there beating the air aimlessly, right? What is he attacking? beating his own body. Now, I have to explain here. I'm not advocating flagellating yourself when you go home. So Luther used to beat himself to compensate for his sins. We don't need that because Jesus was beaten on our behalf. So don't go home and beat yourself. And don't, I'm not advocating self-harm in any way. This body is a gift of God and we should take care of it and it's precious, right? What he's talking about here is a strict aggressive attack on our sinful nature saying no to what our sinful nature wants to do. Because our sinful nature does not want us to follow our God, to take up our cross, to obey his commands. Our sinful nature says, I am my own God and no one's going to tell me what to do. And you and I as Christians say to our sinful nature, that dirty word, I'm a child of God. I'm going to follow who? Jesus. Jesus. Very good. I follow Jesus. And I will beat my body into submission. And I will say to it, I'm not going to do this because that is not who God has made me to be. I'm not going to be this way because that's not how God wants me to be. Our sinful nature loves to come up with lots of excuses, though, doesn't it? I remember talking to a gentleman, encouraged him to deal with something a certain way, to go tell someone 
that, uh, that he forgave them for what they did. You know what his response to me was? They're just going to do it again. They don't deserve it because they didn't ask for it. They're, 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 they're going to hold it against me. I'm going to weaken myself. All these excuses as to why he was not going to do what God clearly told him to do. Sinful nature loves to make excuses. In the end, you and I are children of God, and we will do what God tells us to do. Amen? Amen. <laughs> There's this song from the 80s. By the way, the best decade of songs is the 80s, right? <laughs> <laughs> My children and I have a big debate about that. 80s were the best. 70s? <laughs> I don't know, there's like two people here. No, I <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, actually, I'd have a bunch of 70s albums. What are they talking about now? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, follow your heart. Is that what that is? Listen Isn't that that song? Listen to your heart. Yeah. Listen to your heart. No. I know that's what our society says, follow your heart, you know, listen to your heart. And Jesus said that one of our biggest problems is our heart. Out of the heart come all these sinful things. Out of our heart come all these nasty things. Now, if you mean by that, follow what God has encouraged you to do, follow your conscience, okay, that's fine. But that's not what our society says. What our society is saying, follow your desires. The problem is that your desires and my desires are corrupted by our, our sinful nature. And sometimes what we desire is not what God says and what you and I have to say to ourselves, and this is hard, we have to say no to ourselves, no to our desires, to say, I am going to do what God tells me to do. An aggressive, stubborn, roots planted deep into the word of God, I will not be moved. I'm going to beat my body, Paul says. I'm going to discipline myself to do what God would have me do because I know that my sinful nature has nothing good in store for me. All it wants to do is destroy me. Now, motivation is an important thing here. And like I said, it's not for our salvation. It's not so that I am saved is so that I am rooted further into Jesus Christ. Part of that is promises that God has made to you. Okay. He says, God has <laughs> promise that when we learn to follow him, the commandments of God, he promises what? A blessed life, he does. Right? Blessed is the man, happy is the man who does not sit in the seats of mockers, we read in Psalm 1. There's a joy, there's a peace, there's a happiness, there's a satisfaction, there's a purpose, there's a meaning in my life when I follow what God would have me do. I may not feel like doing this thing. I may not feel like this is what I really want to be doing in my life. But God tells me that this is what I need to be doing. And what I learn over time, okay, I remember where I'm going. I don't know if you know this, but I was just talking until I found out where I was supposed to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got it now, right? Um, we just do what God would have us do, right? And God promises blessing when we do those things. Shoot, I love it. <laughs> What's happening today? Oh, yeah. Now, sometimes it'd be nice if our desires were to do what was right and what is good, right? That'd be nice. If our desires came first and then we did what was right and good. But sometimes our desires are not to do what is right and what is good. So then we come up with this excuse, and this is sinful nature again, that says, I'm not going to do what is right and what is good because if I do it, it would be false. It would be fake. I'd be a hypocrite because I don't really want to. What comes first, the desire to do what is good or the doing what is good? Yeah, they both. Sometimes the desire leads to the good. Sometimes we need to do the good so that what follows? 
the desire. Think about how you taught your children how to apologize to each other. When they were small, did they like to apologize to each other? Say you're sorry to your sister. No, I don't want to say sorry to my sister. Say sorry to your sister. Sorry. There's no sorrow in that at all, is there? And yet we make them do it. Why? Because it is the right thing to do, and they learn then over time to follow and to learn that this is a good thing to do. Sometimes we have to do the good, do the right, and the, and the desire will follow. Now, it'd be better if it was the other way, but that's just the reality of our sinful nature that it corrupts even our desire. Here's the thing. These changes that we're talking about, this saying no and following through, uh, saying no to your sinful nature and following through on that, that the capacity to do that is not in you. It's not in you. You can't. We're corrupted. Your sinful nature wants to do what is wrong. The power to do that, the ability to do that, starts and flows from from God. And in our connection with God. The strength, the desire, the ability to make those changes those, those in, in our lives flows from our relationship with Jesus Christ. And the more we understand his love for us, the more we understand his power, the more we are connected to him, the more that those changes take place. A while back we talked about the transformational presence of God. How being in God's presence, in prayer, in song, in church, in the Bible, in, in, in meditation, whatever you do in connection with God, that is what changes us from our, uh, away from our sinful nature to the child of God that he would have us be. And if that connection with our God is weak, then what? We should not expect the change to take place. It's growing in our relationship with Christ that enables us to be transformed into the person that God would have us be. Jesus talks about it this way. He's talking to people about worry. Probably a sin that a lot of people struggle with, worry. Right? He says, don't worry about this, don't worry about that. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. What you need to do is seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. The solution to worry was not to look at all the reasons why you don't have to worry. The solution to worry was to focus on your relationship with, with God. Transformation in the presence of the Lord God Almighty in our hearts and in our lives. And we do this, Paul says, for a prize that will last. Not for a prize that falls apart. In Paul's day, the, the Olympics, you'd win the, you'd win the crown, right? Guess what it was made out of? Olive branch. Guess what happened to that olive branch after a couple of weeks? Yeah, it fell apart. It was no good anymore. He says we don't do it for something that falls apart, that doesn't last. We do it for something that will last what? Everything in this life passes away. You don't do these things just so that I'm a better Christian. You don't do it just so that uh, things go a certain way. You do it because we have an eternal prize that is given to us in Christ Jesus and that's heaven. To discipline ourselves. To fight the sinful nature that is in us. To grow in our strength, our connection with the Lord God Almighty, so that nothing and no one, not even Satan, <coughs> can knock us off of our faith, our relationship with God. The truth is that you and I will fail. I'm not trying to be miserable here. It's true. This side of heaven, that struggle, there will always be that struggle, and it will always be a challenge to try and deal with these things. But in Christ Jesus, in him we have, first of all, forgiveness for all the times that we have failed. And then we have the strength to pick up and try again. We don't discipline ourselves like someone running aimlessly or beating the air. We do this as someone who is serious about our relationship with Jesus. May he strengthen us, and may we find our strength in him, 
to make to to plant ourselves by streams of water by Jesus Christ in Jesus Christ and His grace. Amen. Amen. That's when we needed to end. Let's stay. <laughs>